it is wonderful to be with you and thank you again uh, uh, Jonathan and Kath for the invite to be part of the Destiny family journey and uh, we had a wonderful day yesterday and so appreciate it uh, the people coming again those of you that were there thank you thank you for leaning in I know it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't all easy you probably had to go and lie down after that session um, made your head hurt a little bit frazzled your brain a little bit but well done and grappling uh, with digging deeper and I hope I hope I hope something we said something that we shared will help you on your journey as a follower of Jesus and thank you for the wonderful hospitality as usual so well looked after so well taken care of it's just been absolutely gorgeous and it is uh, my joy to sort of continue today with the series that we've been doing here as part of the teaching of this church the series called God is and if you've missed any of that it's all free on a podcast. You can listen to that again. You can download that and engage with that at your leisure. And I want to continue by reflecting on another aspect of who the Lord is. And that's so important for us as followers of Jesus that we have a sense of who he is. We've got a, an understanding of that in our journey. If you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, and maybe you're here searching and looking, well, this is all so important for you because who the Lord is is crucial to your journey as well. And I want to pick up a story right in the very first book of the Bible, uh, the book of Genesis, and I'm going to read a short story from Genesis chapter 16. So if you've got a Bible and you want to follow the reading with me, then why don't you turn to Genesis 16, whether it's on your uh, phone or your tablet, or you've even got paper like me, um, you can turn to your Bible and find that reading. Now, while you're finding that or looking for that, um, let me just set the scene a little bit. So we're going to be introduced to a man called Abram. Some of you will know him as Abraham. His name hasn't been changed at this stage, so it's the early part of his journey. And God has sort of called this man and has uh, commissioned him for an incredibly special purpose. And part of that purpose is that through this man and his wife, that actually the world will be blessed. Not just his family, the whole world. And eventually, of course, we know if we follow the trajectory of the Bible, we know that the ultimate seed of Abraham and Sarah was Jesus. And that Jesus, in fact, of course, is the person uh, through whom the whole world is being blessed. So this is an incredible story beginning now. But, of course, they aren't aware of any of that. And the Lord gives this man, Abram, and his wife, Sarah, she'll eventually be called Sarah, he gives them a promise about 10 years before this story. And the promise is, you will have a child of your own. Now, that sounds very normal, very natural, but the problem was that even when Sarai could have children in childbearing eight years, she wasn't able to have children. And now the two of them are, well, older. And so uh, this is a sort of a, a double impossibility in many ways. And God speaks and gives them this promise they're going to have a child. And now we are in chapter 16 of Genesis, 10 years later. Okay, so this is important to set the context for what is about to happen. Now, what we're about to read together is a bit edgy. It's a bit troublesome. If it doesn't slightly upset you, then we're not reading it properly. We're reading it with rose-colored spectacles. So this is a slightly upsetting story, but at the same time, it sets up an incredible truth. And out of this, this tragedy, in some ways, an amazing truth comes. So here we go. Are you ready? Genesis chapter 16, verse 1, and it says this. Now, Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant, or strictly speaking, slave, named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. You can see where this is going, right? Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. 
I put my servant in your arms, and now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Really happy home going on here. Your servant, Abraham said, is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Some of the saddest words Abram ever uttered. Do with her whatever you think best. And it says this, then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. Okay, now if we left the story at that point, this is just awful stuff, right? It's just totally dysfunctional stuff going on in this, the life of this man and woman of God, this, this life of faith. But it doesn't end there, thankfully. The story continues, okay? The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. What? Then the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be as numerous, uh, too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son and you shall name him Ishmael. For the Lord has heard your, of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord. Now, God's just named her son. Now she names God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Ro'i. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Could you not have picked a better reading for Mother's Day, John? I mean, come on, lad. Get with it. Now, here's the point. Here's the big idea of this series that we really hope that you will get. Is that how we see the Lord determines everything. Now, this is so important. It's, it's not just how he sees us. That's an amazing idea. How God sees me, how God sees you, how he understands who we are and our value to him. That is a crucially important idea. But I would argue almost equally important is then how I see him. Because how I see him will determine my worship. It will influence my service. It will influence my relationships. It will, in fact, influence the way I see myself. There's not a single part of my life as a follower of Jesus that will not be impacted by how I see the Lord or, conversely, don't see him. And how we see him, or put another way, how we understand him, how we, uh, as it were, appropriate ourselves to who he is, is absolutely crucial for us as we go on in our journey. And that's why the Bible is a story, well, it's just like a double-edged side on this, as far as the Bible is concerned. The Bible is a story of, number one, the Lord revealing himself to us. So sometimes he shows up and he literally says, here's who I am, Okay. Uh, and there's a great example of this, one of my favorites, in fact, from, from Exodus. In fact, it's one of the first times that the Lord really formally introduces himself in terms of like who he really is. We've sort of seen him at work up to this point, but he sort of breaks it down for Moses, one of his followers, and he says to Moses uh, in, in, this, in these sorts of words that I am compassionate and gracious, I am slow to anger, I am abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. And so he, here's the Lord in that instance revealing himself to us. He's, he's showing us who he is. And, and that, that verse has become a bedrock confession in my life. I make that confession every single day as a follower of Jesus. At some point in my devotions, I declare, Lord, you are compassionate. You are gracious. You are slow to anger. 
and you are abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. That is the truth. And if you were here yesterday, you'll know what we mean by that. That's not just true in my experience. That is truth on which I can build my life. The other side of this revelation conversation is when individuals have encounters with God. And sometimes when they have an encounter with him, they see him in a way they've never seen him before. And then they call that out. They name that. They name what they see. To, to use uh, a phrase from a game show, uh, they say what they see. All right? It's, it's they, they are looking at him and then they name that idea. And some of these names you will know really, really famously. In fact, one's already been quoted today in the context of our service. Uh, there's a name we give to God, and it's the name Adonai or, or Yahweh Yireh, or, or, or Jireh, we would pronounce that. Uh, God who provides. Now, that wasn't God who named himself that. It was Abraham who named God that. God provides, and Abraham says, you're the God who provides. And he calls him that. He sees him as the provider God in an amazing way. Gideon called the Lord, the Lord who is my peace. In a moment of strife and conflict, God comes into Gideon's world, and God says, you're the God of peace. You're the God of shalom, which is amazing. David, who was looking after sheep at the time, has a revelation, sees the Lord as his shepherd. Yes, Adonai Ra'ah, this, this shepherd who looks after him. And so we get that amazing psalm where David says, the Lord is my shepherd. That's, that's David saying the Lord and then naming that, writing it down. And then we've got Moses, which is a famous one. And again, a moment of conflict, Moses saw the Lord as his banner. Nisi. This idea, Lord, when the enemies are coming against us, you'll hold up the banner and you'll defend us. So, so what you get in the Bible is these beautiful tension between moments where the Lord reveals himself like by telling us who he is, literally giving us the words about him, and then the Lord reveals himself by showing who he is in action, and then it's humans who put a label to that and name that. This is one of those moments. Hagar encounters the Lord in a really dramatic way. This is one of the most troublesome, dramatic, interesting, exciting stories in the, in the whole of the book of Genesis, if not the whole of the Torah. It's a really head-bending story as we read it from a 21st century perspective. But if you can hold on to all the difficulty of this story and drill into the ultimate revelation at the heart of the story, here's where we're getting that this incredible insight into who this God is. How does she describe him? She describes him as El Roi, the God who sees me. And one of the ideas that I want to present to us today is that we serve a God, a God who is the God who sees This is such an important transformational idea. If I can be living my everyday life in the 21st century world with a revelation, with a belief that there is a God out there who's the creator of heaven and earth, the sustainer of all things, and he sees me, and I really believe that idea, that is transformational. And if you look at the life of Hagar, that insight transforms her moment, it transforms her circumstances, it transforms her direction, it transforms her relationship, it literally transforms her destiny. This woman gets a transformational encounter with God because she sees him in a way she has never seen him before. And that's really important for us as followers of Jesus. What's really important is that me and you are seeing him for ourselves. What we mustn't settle for is seeing him as Jonathan sees him. Now that's helpful, but that's not going to take us the whole way. What, What you mustn't settle for is seeing him as Kath sees him. That's helpful, but it's not going to take us. Or or seeing him as the worship leader sees him. We We are being invited into a journey where we see him 
for ourselves because when we see him for ourselves then when the lights go out and the doors are closed and you and I go back to our normal everyday world we will go back with what we see not with what Jonathan sees or John Andrew sees or Kath sees or Faith sees but with what you see and when you see for yourself everything changes that's why worship is so important. That's why opening the Bible, whether we do it together as a group of Christians or you're doing it like Faith did this morning on her own in the context of her devotions or you're listening to it on you version, whatever way you're engaging with the Bible, that's why it's crucially important because the Bible is the number one insight into who he is. And if we want to try and get who he is, we've got to pay attention to this book in one way or another and also be part of a community that leans into that idea that there is a God who wants to reveal himself and show himself. And we would believe ultimately that this Lord reveals himself in Jesus. And Jesus, as we've been singing about today, dies on the cross in order to give every single one of us a hope and a future. Because here's the big idea, how you see him determines everything. Yep. I've been, I've been on Facebook this morning and I've been looking at all the beautiful comments about mums. And it's lovely. And it's lovely to see that. Uh, and I like those comments that sort of really, uh, not just say, oh, you're a great mum, but say something really nice and personal about that. I, I love that sort of personal nature because here's what that person's expressing this is what I see and I would like the world to see what I see all right now now sometimes people make a comment and and they get a bit excited and they might say my mom's the best mom in the world now I know what you're saying but my mom was the best mom in the world all right now I know what you're saying now now here's the thing that's what they see, but I don't see that. I get they see that. My mom's the best mom in the world. But the problem is I'm going, well, I don't really, I don't really know your mom. I don't know anything about your mom. I, I, I'm, I'm taking your word for it. And that's sort of the challenge of this. Our God's a good God. Now, if you're not seeing that for yourself, you're going, well, I'll take your word for it. Oh, God's gracious. Well, maybe for you. Are you with me? The Lord's with you and he loves you. Well, it doesn't feel like it. Okay, so, so the danger is, well, faith said a lot of cool stuff this morning, leading us in worship. Well, it's okay for you. That's what you see. And that's, that's part of the challenge on our journey. That we can only speak out of what we see to encourage one another that our God is a good God, we see that. But, but the invitation is not for me and you to stop with what someone else sees. But we go, I want to see that. I, I want to know that. I want to know that for me, not just through you. Are you with me? And that's what makes this really exciting and really difficult all at the same time. Because, because that can't be manufactured. I, I would love to be able to call you up the front or just put my hand on you and go, see. All right? But, but only, only the Lord can sort of help with that. An environment like this supports that. Good preaching, good teaching, engaging with the Bible, engaging with other followers of Jesus, all helps that. But actually, that moment of seeing, we can't really predict. And yet it's so important. So there's a tension in this seeing. We need to see, and so we're being called to open our hearts to that. So, so what did Hagar see? Just, just two things I want to leave you with today as hopefully an encouragement for you. First of all, Hagar saw the God who saw her. Now, I want you to see this really, really carefully. It's easy to miss. She calls him el Roe, And literal translation, God the God who sees me. So what she's not saying is the God who sees. But the God who sees me. See the difference? 
And, and, and you can believe in a God who sees because he's all powerful and not believe in a God who sees you. She says, he is, you are the God that sees me. And I don't know if you noticed it in the sort of contrast of our, of our story. You, you may have missed it, but there, there's an incredible, I think, deliberate contrast in the way the story is written between Sarah's treatment of Hagar and God's treatment of Hagar. And in fact, you might not have noticed this, but every reference of Sarai to Hagar, she never uses her name. She refers to her strictly, literally, as her slave. Okay? Now, the NIV, my version of the Bible, softens that up to maidservant because the word can mean maidservant, but if you read the story of Abram and Sarai, she's a slave. She is not a maidservant in the sort of I'm employing you to clean my house sort of sense. She's a slave. She's owned by Abram and Sarah. They have probably picked her up in Egypt when they lived there. So they've acquired this woman as part of their possession, and she's a slave. And it's really interesting that Sarai never calls her by name in the whole of the chapter. Did you notice that? And I think that's deliberate in direct contrast to the opening words of the angel of the Lord. The opening words of the angel of the Lord are Hagar, slave of Sarai. Where have you come from and where are you going? You see the, you see the contradiction in that statement? So here's the angel of the Lord calling her by name and yet he's asking her, where have you come from and where are you going? Well, he knows where she's come from and he knows where she's going because he knows her name. He already knows everything about her. But there is this beautiful, deliberate contrast in the story. Sarai refers to Hagar as the slave. Take my slave, use my slave, have a baby with my slave. The first reference that God makes to Hagar in the story, he doesn't call her slave, he calls her by her name. All right? Now, you're probably still freaked out by language like slave rather than completely caught up with the idea that God knew her name. God knew her name. Hagar called her by name. He didn't say, hey, who are you? He knew who she was. And I love this. There's a contrast here. Sarah, and this is probably... One of the parts of Sarah's story that, that really doesn't clothe her with glory. You know, on, I, I can understand Sarai's pain because she's desperately wanted a baby. She can't have a baby. We're now 10 years into the journey where God promised a baby. The baby still hasn't arrived. And so in desperation and in pain, she reaches for plan B. We, we totally get all of that and understand all of that. But then Sarai's reaction to Hagar being pregnant, and I know Hagar didn't behave perfectly herself, but Sarai's reaction is shameful, really. And it's a dark moment for the, for the patriarch. It's a dark moment for Abraham. Abraham does not cover himself in glory in this story. He sleeps with his servant far too quickly, in my opinion. Uh, and also, also, he hands her over to be abused by Sarah. It's a terrible moment. Now, what I love about the Bible, it doesn't hide that. If this was the 21st century, that would not be on Instagram. That, that would not be as part of our social media profile because that's way too uncomfortable. We would massage that into the darkness. We would push that away so that the public never sees that behavior. But God puts that behavior at the front because he wants us to see the brokenness of humanity, but their journey to truth and revelation. It's out of this brokenness that one of the greatest revelations of God is about to come to us. He's the God who sees me. And what's really, really interesting is that Sarah sees Hagar as a possession to be used, whereas God sees her as a person to be loved. Now, this is so important. If you just see the God who sees, I mean, that's good. But it's not 
where he wants you to be. He wants you to see the God who sees you. And I've met a lot of beautiful followers of Jesus over the years. Yeah, God loves the world, but they struggle to understand God loves me. They can sort of live with the idea God loves the world, but yet struggle with the idea God loves me. Because they know me. <laughs> they know themselves. God sees the world, yeah. He, he's the God of the universe. But, but here Hagar is saying, you're not just the God who sees the universe, you're the God who sees me. And I love that. And that revelation, that bit, it's not just the bit that God sees. Because in her world, they would have believed in gods who saw. It's the fact that she's seeing a God who saw her. That's the game changer right there. It becomes something personal, intimate, transformational, and revolutionary to her. And that's a revelation that, that I would, if I could give you a revelation, if I, could, if I could package something, hand it to you and say, open that when you get home, it'll change your life forever. If I could give you a Mother's Day gift, uh, then it would be the gift of knowing the God who sees you. Sees right where you are, sees your condition, sees your background, sees your brokenness, sees your pain, sees the status that the world sees you in, but sees beyond all of that and sees the person. Sarai saw uh, Hagar as a possession, as a thing, as someone to be used, and God saw her as a person with a name that to be loved. And that's what transforms Hagar. He sees me. My, my oldest daughter is about to turn 29 years of age. She has a daughter of her own, our very first uh, grandchild, Abigail, and she's doing fabulously well. But when my oldest daughter was much younger, she was part of a dance group. And, um, I, and she loved going to dancing two or three times a week, and we would send her off or take her off to that or whatever. But then it would be that moment where we had to attend the show uh, and I'm not a, I wasn't great at that stuff, I have to say. So, so let me just get that out of the way. I, I wasn't great at wanting to go to watch a group of girls dance. Hard to understand why that would be the case. But I really didn't want to go and watch a bunch of girls dancing around the stage. I just didn't want to do it, even though my daughter was there. And Dawn said to me, John, you've got to go. You're her dad. Just get over it. Get over yourself be a father for five minutes, just go. And so I signed up to go and I went and we bought the tickets and we were there in those little seats all crunched up, you know, really waiting for the show to start. And when the show started, uh, actually I really enjoyed it. It was very, very good. Um, but I noticed something. I noticed as the girls were dancing, I wasn't really watching the girls. I found that as the girls were dancing, I was only watching Elena. And the reason I was watching her was because she was mine. All those other girls were dancing very well. They were probably, and some, some of them were probably better dancers than her. But actually... I only had eyes for one person because she was mine. You are the God who sees me. You are the God who sees me. And I want to pray and believe that that's a revelation that comes to every one of us. Because going back to our world, facing the anxiety and uncertainty and weirdness and wonderfulness of our world with a revelation that there is a God who sees me. It sees me and loves me, and cares for me, and has a purpose and a plan for me, will change everything. Because I want you to see, as I, as I draw this to a close, the second thing, that she, she didn't just see the God who saw her, but she trusted the God who sent her. Now there's an awkward moment in the story. The God who sees her, and is now taking care of her, says to her, you got to go back. And that's the moment where everybody goes, what? 
You're sending me back to an abusive context. You're sending me back to the mistress who abused me. But actually, we, we fail to read the second bit. It goes on to say, I'm sending you back. You need to go back to your mistress, but I'm going to bless you. I'm going to take care of you. If you will trust me, the God who sees you, I will do something for you in this situation that is impossible without my help. At a cultural, social level, it looks like God is sending her back to disaster, but God sees something beyond the cultural, beyond the social, beyond Sarai, beyond this moment. He sees a purpose and a plan. And he's saying to her, will you trust the God who sees you? If you trust me, I am telling you, I will take care of you. Even, on the sur even though on the surface of it, it looks like, I am sending you back into trouble. And did you notice how the story finished? Incredible. Now, again, easy to miss this sort of stuff, but it's worth remembering here what's going on. Verses 15 and 16. We're drawing this to a close. Is the, do you, the band want to come or do you want to wait till I finish? All right. Verses 15 and 16 says this. Listen to these words. It says this. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave, gave him the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. Now, now stay with me. Stay with me. The main protagonist of the story at the beginning is Sarah. She's the one driving the whole thing. By the time we get to the end of the story, Sarah is not mentioned. In fact, when we read the end of the story, we've got three references to Abram, two references to Hagar, two references to Ishmael, no references to Sarah. Because what seems to happen is this. As, as Hagar returns, Abram steps up. And he realizes that perhaps what we did to this woman was wrong, even though she's a slave. We, we did something wrong. And so Abram steps up and he becomes her protector. He becomes the one who takes care of her. He becomes the one who names the boy. And the fact that he names the boy Ishmael, he's agreeing with Hagar's story. Remember, it was the angel of the Lord who gave Ishmael his name. So when she goes back, she tells Abram the story and Abram gives Ishmael the name Ishmael, which literally means God hears. Now when we look at the start of the story, it looks like God is sending her back to disaster. But when we look at the end of the story, God has now made a way for her. Abram accepts her. Abram looks after her. Abraham takes care not only of her, but of Ishmael as they go forward. And Hagar has been called to trust the God who sees me. When we see the God who sees us, we can trust him where he's sending us. We can trust him with the details of our future. We can trust him with what is around the corner, even though we don't know what's around the corner. We can trust him with the unknown and the unexpected. We can trust him with that which seems to be out of control because the God who sees you sees me, has a plan for us. The God who sees us, loves us. The God who sees us, wants the best for us. The God who sees us, will never leave us, and he will never abandon us. The God who sees us, has details waiting for us that seem impossible and unreasonable and, and improbable in our lives right now. But we're able to walk into the unknown, not because we're brave, but because we believe in the God who sees us. Because he sees me, I can trust where he's sending me. Because he sees me, I can trust where he's leading me. Because he sees me, I can trust him with the detail of my future. And Hagar's life changes because she sees not just God, but she sees the God who sees her, and in seeing the God who sees her, she trusts him with her future. And that story happened thousands of years ago, and yet it is as relevant to me and you today as if it happened today. The, the, the details are, are a bit unusual, 
They're, they're not like the world in which we live in some ways, but yet the core ideas are exactly the same. You and I face a world of challenge and strife and uncertainty and anxiety, but we look up to the God who sees us. And if he sees us, then we can trust him that he will lead us and guide us and direct us. And I want to pray right now that just as the Lord revealed himself to Hagar, he will reveal himself to us. Lord, help me to see that you are the God who not only sees, but the God who sees me. Lord, help me, just as Hagar did, to trust you with my future, to trust you with the details of tomorrow, to trust you with where you are sending me and leading me. So that, Lord, I can have full confidence in you. I, I just invite you, if you can stand, would you stand with me as I pray for you right now? We're going to sing a song together as, as the service draws to a close. But before we sing, I want to pray. How we see him determines everything. This is the first time a human in the Bible names God. And what an incredible moment that it's a slave who names him. It's a woman on the run who names him. It's an outcast who names him. It's not a theologian. It's not a leader. It's not a great man of God. It's this broken woman who names him. And she gives him a name that's the first named name of God from a human in the Bible. In fact, it's the only time in the whole of the Bible this name is used. And yet it is a name of powerful revelation and truth. You are the God who sees me. So Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. That Lord, for each of us, a spirit of wisdom and revelation will be upon us so that we can know you better. Lord, I pray that the eyes of our heart will be enlightened so that we would know the hope to which we've been called. Lord, I pray like Hagar, our eyes will be open to see the God who sees me. We thank you, Lord, you see the world. We thank you that your eyes are roving across the nations of the world with all our trouble and with all our difficulty and strife. But Lord, your word declares through the revelation of this story that you are not just a God who sees the world, but you are the God who sees me. And Lord, right now where we are, you see us. And Lord, I pray that that revelation will become a powerful truth to every person in this room. And Lord, in seeing the God who sees us, we will come to a place of trusting the God who sends us. That Lord, we will trust you with today, trust you with tomorrow, trust you with the details of our lives that are outside of our control. That we will trust that if you see us, it's because you love us. If you see us, it's because you have a plan for us. If you see us, it's because you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. And so Lord, I pray your blessing on each one of us. May our eyes be open. May we see the God who sees us in Jesus' name. Amen.